Gregory Lim. I am a visiting scholar here at BitShares HQ, and I'm presenting some of the research I did with my colleague Jeremy Rand uh, over at Namecoin. Um, the talk is titled SSL is basically equivalent to plain text, the end of security iconography. This research was undertaken as part of coursework at a major Seattle research university. Um, however, it was not run past the Human Service Review Committee, so I can't say exactly which research university, but it was reviewed by a credentialed adult, so no participants were harmed in the making of this research. Uh, web encryption relies upon users checking this very small lock icon at the, in the URL bar. Uh, essentially, if you are going to a website that you might be entering in passwords or reading things you wouldn't want anybody else to read, you are supposed to look for the presence of this icon. And if it's not there, you're not supposed to log in because there's no encryption. Um, there's been a lot of research on this in the past. We've had some eye tracking studies that showed that when users looked at the icon when it was present, but ignored the icon's absence, um, and we've also had some behavioral research showing that when users logged in on their, that even when it was gone, users would still log in onto their accounts. Um, and in 2009, uh, Marlon Spike ran this really great little hack. Uh, he set up a malicious Tor exit node, ran, run, and ran SSL strip on it so that all the connections that came through his Tor exit node, um, essentially this, this is, if you're, not, if you're not familiar with Tor, um, it's an anonymity network. Um, what would happen is you would go to Facebook and he would, Facebook would send the message to his Tor exit node, remove the encryption so the icon was no longer there. It would then go through the anonymity network and then pop out to the user. So it still, everything was secure for the user, but the icon was no longer there. Um, he ran this for 24 hours. He got 300 logins, 117 email accounts, 16 credit card numbers, um, seven PayPal logins, and no one, after loading a page, then bailed. No one loaded a page and that would ask for login information and then didn't follow up with an actual login. Um, this is in 2009. Uh, EV icons had been released and were supported at that point, but he did not break that out in his data, and it was not widely supported, or it was not widely used at the time. Um, we wanted to look and see if extended validation certs, uh, these extended validation certs, which are this much more complex uh, visual indication which you have a green icon and the entire name of the corporation that the certificate is supposedly belongs to is displayed to the user. Um, so we decided to focus on EV certs to see what their efficacy was, if any. Um, this used uh, a between subject design, participants were asked to log in to their uh, you know, social media accounts, basically Twitter, because Twitter is the only one that uses extended validation logins, uh, email, Outlook, because Outlook's the only one that uses it, um, and then ask to log into their bank account. Um, the control condition had no changes, it just showed that it was just a regular web browser. Um, I actually uh, missed the data gathering day, so I just showed up to my university's library and randomly approached strangers and said, hey, I've got a social science study on using how, how we interact and communicate online, da da da, and offered people $5 to take part in this research study, and then I would take the participants back to computers that I had already logged into, um, one of them being a computer which, being over the internet, was still encrypted locally, it would remove it, but it's already local on your machine, so it, it doesn't really matter. Um, this was really super sketchy, right? This was just me showing up to University Research Library. I had like, you know, some large post-it note thing and very 
uh, saying, you know, research study, anybody could have walked in there and done it. Um, and we also, you know, the variables were basically, did people log in at the same rates in both groups? Um, then we asked some questions about, did you notice anything odd? Did you notice the lack of an EV certificate? Did you avoid logging to any accounts because you were, you know, because I basically showed you the machines I had owned? Um, and the finding was that there were no statistical significance between the two groups. Um, there were three participants who claimed to notice the lack of an EV cert. Uh, however, two of them logged in anyway. Uh, there's only one participant who refused, to, who refused to log in at all, and that was a CS major. Um, and, you know, this, we had only about 20 or so users total. Uh, we lost, you know, one CS major who didn't want to, another one due to login technical issues. Um, still, st no statistical significant. It was, there was no statistically significant difference between the groups. Uh, and we, you know, we replicated studies with much larger user counts. Um, and, you know, honestly, I was forced to actually have a control group because otherwise, as my professor said, you're just counting how many users you can own in this method. And I said, well, yeah, but uh, overall, it's not secure. That's the thing. Um, I got a lot of, you know, I could have gotten a lot of people's bank accounts. Um, and certainly, basically, everyone's Twitter and email passwords. Um, the, you know, if this largely replicates other findings, um, you know, what's the difference? Um, what I'd like to do is, you know, kind of couple these results with fundamental psych theory uh, to prove that the security model itself is unfixable. Um, I would like to redefine the problem that we're trying to solve uh, because I, I believe that there are two orthogonal issues and that by trying to solve them both, we're at the same time is what has stymied efforts in the past. Um, so I want to push for incremental improvements and I really want to push for new openings, for new research to solve these problems, for, to solve the, the larger issues at stake. Um, so number one, this is a problem that, you know, the security model itself can't be fixed, right? We went from just showing HTTPS to showing a lock in the bar to finally extended validation, which was rolling out sometime in late 2008. Um, this is a model that we've tried to patch a few times, but we know isn't working. Uh, you know, what is very strange, however, is that in the research community, when we have gotten these findings, um, we don't, you know, researchers tend to blame themselves. They tend to blame the artificialness of the environment, and I think it's because it's almost, you know, a hundred percent success rate. Um, so, the quote here: "We found no evidence that security was checked at all, and we were unsuccessful in reproducing normal browsing behavior during our study." That's a very bizarre claim because I would say that um, the present study shows that this is totally wrong, that, you know, we had people use their own accounts in a very sketchy situation, um, that they should have had a very heightened sense of security, uh, and that if using dummy data was a problem, you wouldn't be seeing that, like we see in our studies. Uh, Marlin Spike study in 2009, um, you know, some others that, that ask people to use their actual information. Um, so we can also kind of take this to the logical extremes, the illogical extremes in which we take the entire browser Chrome and dedicate it towards just displaying security information. So at this very top, this is an extended validation. In the middle, you have a regular SSL cert, and at the bottom, you have unencrypted. Um, just once we're asked these, you know, they were basically shown these sites or asked to go to these websites with those different levels of uh, validation. Um, and then asked, how trustworthy is this site? Uh, one of their hypotheses was that the, when presented with the site, the lower one, number C here, that they would trust the site less. And this didn't happen. Um, what was interesting is that in the actual researcher's commentary, they said that there wasn't enough time for people to habituate to this. That, 
that over time people would come to re to associate these more secure visualizations with more secure sites, um, and that the study duration is too short for what's going on. I would argue the opposite, that people would habituate and start to ignore the Chrome itself uh, and these security icons, and that over time you would see a diminished amount of responses because people just don't notice anymore. Um, what's interesting is that the problem is that you know we see this you know just as we see in research as researchers trying to rationalize these results uh, to fit the model. Uh, I also see this in industry that the belief in this model kind of warps our our logical worldview. One of the one of the interesting industry responses that I got from one of our friends is you know he's a legit security researcher uh, you know almost always the smartest person in the room. Um, you know after explaining this he looked at me and said you know. I think we should use three certificate authorities, right? And they just started going into this long, and it was like, no, you don't, like, that, that's not the problem. Um, you know, and in 2011, um, Chrome actually implemented Dane, which is uh, using DNS to store your certificate, to store your public keys, essentially, so that uh, the browser wouldn't need to talk to a certificate authority, it could just talk to DNS and see where the keys were stored. Um, but in, his, in the blog post kind of discussing this change, the potential negative drawbacks that he talks about um, all kind of exhibit the belief in this broken model, um, in that you know, it should be hard for CA search to get PayPal.com, but then, and he keeps going, but, you know, the, you know, so that, say, so it should be, he, in 2011, um, Chrome actually implemented Dane, which is this way of storing your public certificate keys in DNS. Um, and in the blog post describing this change, you can actually see how, you know, belief in this broken model was being used as, you know, the potential downsides of why this might be a bad change. Um, you know, it should be hard for CA search to get PayPal, P-A-P-A, one.com. Um, but then he, you know, immediately after that says, you know, but, you know, we can check for this in, in, in the browser as well. Um, he also then talked about, you know, if you want a certificate that identifies a legal entity rather than a domain name, you want an EB cert. But as we just showed, you actually don't identify a legal entity. You know, that's not what users aren't looking to identify a legal entity and certify the legal entity. We're not even seeing users looking to see if that belongs to the right URL, right? Um, and if DNSX if DNSSEC stable certificates end up being predominantly used for abuse, uh, they wanted to kill them. Uh, this being the idea that attackers would actually bother to encrypt their communications with SSL. Uh, and a year later, this support for this security protocol was killed due to lack of use. Um, and I understand, you know, there's additional, you know, every line of code is additional weight in the browser itself. But it feels like the, reason, the negative reasons to not support this and to just leave that code in place didn't outweigh the cost of leaving it there. Um, and belief in this broken model is really blocking progress, both in industry and research. So there's a bunch of logical, logical fallacies that we just talked about. Um, one, that users check or even understand URLs, right? So you can have Bank of America at securelylogin.com. Um, I was actually talking about this to one of my professors and trying to have her, you know, I was asking this professor to go to, let's say, twitter.com, and the instead of going to twitter.com, the professor typed twitter.com into the Google search bar and then clicked on the top result. So it's pretty clear that a PhD professor who is, you know, very, very smart person, uh, you know, certified smart person, 
um, doesn't understand what URLs is, and to be honest, shouldn't need to. Um, users don't understand cer encryption certificates. They don't understand what's being issued to who and how it's a legal entity. Um, attackers won't necessarily use SSL. Uh, we're assuming attackers use SSL, and that belief is only brought about by the belief that people actually check to see if SSL is there to begin with, which they're not. Um, you know, and as we said before, the idea that users will become more alert over time as they become used to this new system that they're supposed to be doing. That's a logical fallacy as well. Uh, they don't become more alert over time. It's called habituation. We become less alert of the small things that we see day in and day out, and if they're suddenly missing one day, we just won't notice at all. Um, the other thing is that statistically, you, see, you know, we get security researchers saying, hey, we made this improvement to Chrome, uh, in the Chrome, in the, you know, basically the skin of the browser, uh, and it, you know, we got slightly better results, right? Uh, that's not good enough, right? That's not secure. Uh, and as you can see here, with their plugin, uh, you know, some 30% of the users are getting owned, even with this, the, you know, the skins I showed earlier where it was, the entire browser is dedicated to trying to convey the security information. Um, so lesson number one, security iconography model cannot be fixed. Um, we need to kill it. We need to stop believing in this fallacy. Um, and to kind of illustrate this, I have a fun little video to show why it's impossible for us to ever notice these things. Oh, wait, that's on my computer, not here. Let's see. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Um, this is a nice, this is a nice little video. And a lot of people have seen it, but I kind of have another... I believe that 50% rate of seeing the gorilla is artificially high. Because you're in a psychology study, you're kind of waiting for, you know, where, you know they're screwing with me. It's a psychology study. It wouldn't be a psychology study if you're not screwing with me. So, um, this is about the cognitive spotlight. Uh, conscious processing, when you're consciously thinking about something, it requires serial processing. This is called the cognitive spotlight. And you can only focus on one thing at a time. And what happens is that in order to do anything, in order to walk and chew gum at the same time, in order to drive and pay attention to what else is going on, changing the stereo, you have to start automating things elsewhere, right? You can't be focusing on, you don't have unlimited processing power. Um, and this is kind of what I believe this video shows a bit more. 
Draft is widely considered to be the very best pickpocket in the entire world. Apollo Robbins is known as the Gentleman Thief, but it's all in good fun. He is here from Las Vegas to show us how he does it. And I'm joined now, of course, by Ryan Seacrest and Willie Geist. Apollo, it's great to see you. <laughs> you notice how we're dwarfing our guests. There's a canyon between us. You're different than a guy we might run into on the street, not here on the plaza, of course, but on the street. What they're doing is illegal. What you're doing is in good fun. And we've been told very little about what your plans are this morning. That's good. That's great. Okay. Well, I thought it might be easier and less invasive if I give you something of mine and I try to steal it back from you. Uh, I noticed you had a few things just from looking at your pockets, uh, kind of a, what items you might have. Uh, do you have a wallet on you right now? I do not. No, no. All right. You don't so, have a wallet on you? I don't carry a wallet. I don't either. <laughs> no, I actually don't it's, either. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you Take don't have to this, drive. Put yeah. this inside your inside jacket pocket for me. Okay. Uh, now, that's a harder pocket to steal from. They call this a pit or working up town. It makes it harder for me to get inside without you at least seeing my face. So I'm try as to keep tight as a drum. <laughs> <laughs> I'm clenching every muscle. Look at his soul. I'll be gentle. I'll be gentle. Okay, all right. And uh, we'll give a little bit of cash for you as well. If you uh, Do you have any cash on you right now? Uh, I'll take your cash, actually. <laughs> yeah. Here, let's do this. If I do this, I'll give it two places. Okay. This I'm going to just be able to have in reach. All right. And then put this inside your front pants pocket because a lot of people think that's a safe place to keep things. Right. And then for you, uh, just something simple. Uh, if you take this uh, pen, now there's two pieces to a pen, so try to keep track of both, but put it inside your jacket. You get a form. wallet, he gets cash. <laughs> you get a <laughs> pen. Thanks. A very expensive uh, pen. Okay. And then just put it inside your jacket. I'll show you kind of how it works. Uh, with me approaching you, uh, I have to get inside your space. And to make you comfortable, your eye contact sometimes feels a little bit intense if I approach. But mm -hmm. if I break eye contact, I can get in very close. Uh, if I keep eye contact, you'll feel it all the way up into your zone. Right. right. Uh -huh. So if I did it this way, let me go ahead and step over on this side. I'll try uh -huh. this with you. Uh, so you have a few things on you right now. You have your watch, I which do. doesn't come off very well, but your belt does. Do you still have your belt on at the moment? <laughs> Double check? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> you have to watch close for these things. If you would do this for me for a second, do what's I? in your front pocket? Oh, do you still have the credit cards as well? <laughs> Do you still have your credit cards? I do. Uh, don't I put do. your hands in your pocket. Okay. That's a different show. Okay. Just check the bottom of your pocket. So you have something over there on that side, didn't you? Sir? I do, yes. All right, great. Just checking out of what you do have. It's hard to tell. Look at this Stip guy. Sorry, Look at this guy. Look at this guy. He just <laughs> lifted my credit card. Wait, just wait, 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 just, just check your wrist. Better. You didn't have What's a whole lot on you. Where was the pen that you had a while ago? Did you put that in somewhere safe? You're right here. Okay, so that was harder to get to because of the microphone, I believe. the wire. Okay. Where was your wallet at? Uh, is that in the inside jacket here? Yes, it was. All right. Would you check to see if that's still there? It is not there. <laughs> Willie? All right. So out of those items, just to make this fast, I believe the pen is gone, yes? The pen is <laughs> gone. The wallet is gone. Is the cash gone, sir? Uh, the, ca the cash is gone, yes. Okay. Thank so you. I have a few things. Let's here's your credit cards, your IDs, and then those items as well. They used to Thank be in you. your pocket. And here's my favorite part. <laughs> and your watch, sir. I believe <laughs> I did not notice that. <laughs> Swear to God. Thank you. How, how did you do that? That's a, though, how did you get his watch? Yeah, show us how you yeah, did the that watch one. blew me away. How did you do that? I'd be happy to. Here, come on over this way. Uh, so when stealing something like this, I, when I draw your attention, there's different ways. During a handshake, you can do this. It's a bit of a squeeze. So he feels like the watch is still on, but I've got it unfastened. So at this point, it still feels like it's there, but it's easy enough for me at this point, as I'm reaching across, had you been looking at the kind of there, but show the video because we have the slow mo been looking at the of it actually passing. happening when he did had it. You been looking at the way that it I was. I was looking at like the horse comes over the end of the wrist. Wow! So I had reach wow! Look how quick and you did to watch that, him hold it up behind your head. That was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you were That's laughing. At I, <laughs> I had no idea. Uh, Thank man, you. I am impressed. So. You know, that's what's happening when you load a web page, right? You load a web page, your, your cognitive, your spotlight is being drawn to the task at hand, okay? You don't have unlimited processing power. Um, what happens is that tasks that are competitive, repetitive, become habituated. Anything that is uh, not having to do with the task at hand gets removed from, from the cognitive spotlight. Um, you know, and human factors researchers, moderate improvements to novel icons are due to their, you know, their novelty. And this goes back to real, real basic psychology, 1960s, you know, stimulus response and extinction. You know, if you have a stimulus, you get a response, and then if nothing really happens after that, you just keep flashing that stimulus, the response eventually fades away. Um, and that's what you were seeing when 
you know, the pickpocket, the, the only appropriate model here is to interrupt the task flow. Is to, when you know that something is not secure, you have to stop the user from what they're doing. You have to interrupt what they're doing. Um, because, as you saw with the pickpocket, what he was doing every time was directing their attention. He would bring their attention to actually what he was trying to steal so that he could apply pressure on it. He would misdirect their attention so that he could then remove it because they would register that new response, you know, that, that stimulus, and then they'd look away and he would have it, their attention somewhere else. Um, so this is, you know, lesson 1.5. Usability security bugs are as severe as programming security bugs. And this one in particular is nearly deterministic, right? If I'm able to get you onto my connection, I will be able to get your login password without having to compromise a CA whatsoever, right? Anyone in your, you know, your network admin in your office can have your passwords. Who, whoever is running your router at home with all your roommates can have your passwords. It's, I can take a Wi-Fi router, have the same name, drop it closer to your location, and have all your passwords. It's that simple. There's no need to go and compromise a secure CA a certificate authority in order to get it. Uh, and what's really irritating about this is that when algorithms are broken, there's mass panic, right? When um, go to fail occurred, Apple had a four-day lag between fixing iOS and OS X, and they got a lot of shit for that. Um, security icons have been broken for over a decade, and we're not, we're, we don't give a shit, apparently. Um, you know, usability is security. Uh, if aeronautical engineers treated gravity as antithetical to flight, we'd still be waiting around for magical anti-gravity devices instead of getting on planes and flying. Um, I think I think the security industry has actually woken up to this. Like, this was pretty radical, just even just a year or two ago. Um, but usability really is security, and I think that these early attempts at what we were doing is a lot like the Wright brothers, where it was you know somebody got onto a plane and they flew the length of a field. Um, we're not to the point where we can shove everybody on the plane and be secure yet, uh, but we're going to get there. And the way we're going to do that is to recognize that we have orthogonal problems, right? We need to separate the need to encrypt from fraud detection and authenticity. Um, I'm, I understand that encryption, proper encryption, still requires authenticity. I, I get that. Um, but if we can just, we need to, I'll, I'll, I'll try to show how tackling these problems separately means that we can solve both of them. Uh, uh, that by tying these two issues together, it makes it very hard to get anything done. Um, and we can go, you know, the history of this is that the web security model um, of certificate authorities was one of a series of 4 a.m. decisions at Netscape in the 90s when it was in a battle startup. Uh, Marlon Spark did some really great research. He actually called the guy who implemented SSL and just said, you know, got him on the phone. The guy was, I think, in a retirement home. And he said, oh, yeah, SSL, I hadn't thought about that in a long time. And he just said, yeah, it was all kind of a hand wave. Right? The fundamental basis for the majority of online security is a hand wave. Um, the other thing is that you know back then encryption overhead was non-trivial. Uh, you had to, I believe at the time, you had to pay RSA if you wanted to use RSA encryption. Uh, you know, an early, early publisher, you know, the early web was very publisher centric, and that two-way communications were you know reserved for mail or Usenet, you know, email rather, not just you know, back. Back when we called it email instead of it was mail, uh, Usenet, um, you know these other protocols, IRC. It was it was in you know there would be very very few things you could you know log onto a website for. Um, 
And they thought, you know, there might be a dozen sites or so that you would need encryption for. You know, your banks, maybe, right? Um, that is clearly not the case. Uh, you know, the other thing about it at the time was that they were worried about, you know, they didn't really, there was no Google, right? The Yahoo was literally, when this happened, Yahoo was a single page with like a dozen links on it. Um, and the notion was that we needed a third party to say that bankofamerica.com was actually owned by Bank of America and that if you went to thebankofamerica.com, the certificate of authority would be able to say, aha, I see that you're trying to trick users into going to this, you know, this URL and log in. But I'm not going to give you a cert I'm not going to give you my encryption certificate. Um, the other weird thing that this caused is that, you know, certs cost a lot of money and that, you know, there are 650 trusted organizations. Uh, this has had the effect of, you know, having it cost much money is at the effect of there not being universal encryption. Um, and the 650 trusted, or, trusted organizations has made this trust essentially useless. It costs $50,000 to get a pop-up certificate authority for yourself that you can then run and sign people's certs. Um, the problem is that while these, you know, kind of these last two problems are infuriating, uh, attempts at replacing them have largely failed because they tried to do too much. Um, convergence was Marlin Spike's stab at replacing the certificate authority system. Uh, it was based on the idea that you would have notaries who would kind of track SSL information for all websites on the web, um, and it would triangulate encryption information, so you'd have at least three different independent organizations saying this is the SSL I saw for this site, this is the SSL I saw for this site, and this is the SSL I saw for this site. Uh, you know, there's, but there's a lot of similar projects that try to do this triangulation. Uh, you know, Perspectives and Monkey Sphere, uh, they kind of never took off. Uh, and Marlon Spike actually abandoned this project a year later. I mean, he put a lot of work into this, it was fairly sophisticated. And uh, he didn't even last himself on the project for a year. Um, you know, what's interesting about this problem is that from an information theoretic standpoint, uh, we've, we've seen this play out multiple times. You know, you have a sender, you have a receiver, and you have information. Uh, this is true of the web, this is true of email, and this is true of SSH. And if you look at these slides, I'm actually using JavaScript equals, not regular equals. Uh, so, they're, you know, they're basically you get this same interaction happening at all sides. Um, and if you break things down into fraud detection and encryption, you can kind of, we can kind of start seeing which ones work and which don't. Uh, we can tell that fraud encryption, fraud detection and encryption, the web sucks at both of these things. SSL is pretty good at encryption, fraud detection is not so great at. Um, and email is really good at fraud detection. It's not so great at encryption. Snowden's uh, kind of pushed us a bit further in that regard. Um, but I think that the lesson from this is that change is always incremental. Change on the web is always incremental. We always implement new things slowly. It's very rare that we can get all three browsers to all jump in sync. And we usually have to have at least one of them dragging them, kicking and screaming into our way of doing things. So if we break this problem down, we, we can kind of start with authenticity and fraud detection uh, as, as one major component. Email fraud detection is really pretty good. Um, it's good enough for 99% of the time. It's done primarily through statistical analysis of sender and the receiver and the content. Um, and, you know, and even spear phishing, you know, a high-level target like the RSA attacks that happened, that requires a few to zero days. Uh, and browsers and OSs deserve some blame for this. Um, but it's, it's pretty good. Um, web fraud detection, there, there really isn't much there. It's all blacklist-based, right? Um, part of this is that, you know, there's a lot less fraud than an email because in, on the web you're kind of you're, you use Google and you just go to the sites that you want to go to. It's very rare that people will send you links. It's usually from these other areas such as email that you get a link that you then follow in your browser that then owns you. Um, 
But I think we can do a hell of a lot better than the fish tank. We can get much better than these blacklist technologies. Um, as I said, this is, this is an area for future research. Um, I think it's basically going to come down to correlating user input types uh, along with sites. We already track usernames, passwords, and addresses uh, that have been visited before. We can detect input of credit card numbers, social security numbers. It's a little hard to internationalize that, but we can and we should. Um, you know, and research shows that people log into about 25 sites uh, and they appear to be using different passwords from financial sites. Uh, and there's a lot of very really good stuff on machine learning uh, and visually matching these sites so that, for instance, you could figure out which banking websites a user logs into regularly and you could do some and do visual analysis and then if someone logs into a site that looks like that and they're trying to input their password information like that, but clearly from the URL it's a different site, you could then do some sort of warning. Um, but like I said, this is an area for future research. It's not something I'm trying to take on. It's not uh, something I can take on. It's but you know what's what I think is interesting that if you know maybe if we can introduce some kind of competition into the system, get rivalries working between browsers. You know that's a really great way to get everything faster. Maybe we can get everything a lot more secure as well. Um, there's a lot of other cool stuff. Well, and 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 to say that you know once we stop worrying about the encryption side of this, and, and once we kind of throw out the CA cert model, that allows us to focus on these fraud specific solutions instead of just abdicating responsibility to certificate authorities because they're really not doing their job anyway. FIDO is really great. Uh, it is kind of what HTTP authentication was meant to be. That is part of the browser UI instead of the website UI. Um, and it also makes it so that you know the user just types in a single master password and there's encryption information, usually in a hardware form, um, that it can then authenticate against, but it's not, you know, people won't be able to skim your password anymore because it's more like a SSH style exchange of information. Uh, not exactly the same, but, uh, you know, the SSL, the SSL observatory is great. Uh, I don't see a reason that, you know, we, should, we that sort of thing where we're tracking SSL information can and should be used by browsers to decide if the site is safe. Uh, HSTS is an interesting protocol that says, you know, if you've logged in here once, it's, it's a lot like SSH itself in that it says, okay, um, the, the first time you visited a site, it can say, from now on, I want you only just to communicate with me over a secure connection. And from then on, if it tries to downgrade to an unencrypted connection, It'll sh you know it'll show an error. Uh, the problem with this is that SA SHTS is only is only supported by two out of the three major browsers. Uh, Internet Explorer is set to have it in version 12, um, and at least as of yesterday, when I tried logging in to 10 of the top, or when I I checked 10 of the top <laughs> 10 of the top banks, uh, nine of them did did not use HSTS. Uh, so I. I I still feel secure and this attack is still deterministic because HSTS isn't saving us yet. I also think that we need to have a future for certificate authorities. Certificate authorities have a lot of power. Um, you know, they were using encryption to print money a long, long before Bitcoin came around. Um, their people uh, are in standards committees and they control a lot of these these standards and the way things are done. However, I think that they want to provide real value. I think that certificate authorities are in a real tough spot because they know that they're not providing the value that they want to be providing. And I think that they would wholeheartedly embrace new areas to make money. <laughs> uh, I think they'd wholeheartedly embrace new areas where they can actually provide the type of encryption that they claim to be providing or the, the type of security that they claim to be providing. Um, you know, browsers can track the number of users typing, you know, entering in certain types of information into different sites. 
Uh, and certificate authorities could guarantee some level of insurance, right? And so this insurance would be different for sites that just take in sort of, you know, credit cards versus bank accounts versus social security numbers. Um, but the browsers could actually get a, you know, statistically valid, know how many people are logging into these sites and how much insurance these, that, you know, some order of magnitude, the amount of insurance that these sites should have such that if there is a major compromise of the system, that the users, you know, will be protected. You know, at least they'll get LifeLock or one of those um, credit monitoring solutions. Maybe get their money back, those sorts of things. Um, and this also puts the certificate authorities in a place where they can give discounts to more secure customers, you know, and, and what they're actually charging for matches the amount of security that is being provided. So, for example, Home Depot would have been penalized because they were, you know, they recently got hacked and it turned out they were running a bunch of insecure software and didn't have very good OPSEC. If an auditor had come through and said, hey, you're not running very good, you know, your, your OPSEC isn't very good, and we, you know, did some pen testing and got right through, well, we're going to have you buy a whole lot of insurance or we're going to drop you entirely. Um, but places that do have very good OPSEC and can actually be tested against can have lesser amounts of insurance, right? It's not, obviously, security is never going to be a binary, we're always solid, we're always secure, there's nothing that can penetrate us, but we can get levels of risk and start to actually associate those levels of risk with the actual price people are paying. Now, web encryption itself, you know, as a separate problem, um, I think that the fix is incremental. I think we need to embrace self-signed certificates. We need to embrace Dane, which is including encryption information in DNS. And eventually, we need to reject unencrypted connections entirely. So step one in this is to have self-signed certs okayed by the browser vendors. Um, right now, if you have a self-signed cert, a certificate that is not signed by a certificate authority, you get this big scary warning. The assumption being that encryption iconography indicates that the, secure, that the site has been authenticated as the correct place by the certificate authority, so the self-signed search will give people a false sense of protection. That's just incorrect. Um, as we've shown. That's, that's, that's just not what's going on. Um, I think we should enable TLS certificate verification mode for CDNs. That might be something we need to look into or, you know, maybe, uh, you know, if not that, um, there's some, also there's some HTML encryption uh, signing that can be done. There's some standards. Um, you know, and for the diehards that are really locked into using these icons, we can just not show the lock icon when there's a self-signed certificate. That's fine. Uh, and what's great about this is there's only four vendors involved, four people that we really need to talk to for 95% of the market, and it's a single tweak, and it's a very minor tweak, right? We just say, we're not going to show this warning anymore. It's okay. Um, it would actually remove code from the logic flow, right? It would, it would just, it would be fewer lines of code in the browser, which everyone loves. Um, on the HTTP, on the HTTP server side, um, there's only really, there's, there's one fewer, there's only really three major HTTP server vendors. Um, just have them turn on self-signed certificates by default. Just have all new connections, just create a new self-signed cert, it's in some directory, all new stuff happens. Three vendors, 90% of the market, another minor tweak. It, I would, you know, Apache's default name for self-signed certificates is a snake oil cert. Um, I think self-signed certs are probably uh, the only non-snake oil certs out there to be honest, uh, and we need to recognize that and move on from the current system. The last bit is Dane, which is uh, you take your public keys or your fingerprints and you shove them into DNS records. This isn't perfect, right? There's, you know, validating DNSSEC is not 
all there yet, um, but it's better. It's an incremental improvement. Uh, that information is available to all of the browsers right away. Um, this is also a publicly auditable process, right? Right now, any CA cert, if it's any CA cert is compromised, then the entire web is compromised. Uh, so, you know, basically any government agency, any one, any, you know, organized crime group, anybody with fifty thousand dollars can arbitrarily man in the middle any site, uh, even under the assumption that we're checking for those SSL icons, which we're not. But um, this is a publicly auditable process, so if the .com CLD gets compromised, it's a really big deal. And we can figure out where it happened, and if it happens once, we can fix it. Uh, it's much, much better than this cumulative 650 organizations all signing these certificates. Um, you know, we can, you know, if you really like those lock icons, you can show them for Dane. Um, and, you know, maybe at some point there would be, you know, a tipping point where all the browser vendors are accepting self-signed certs. Um, and, you know, maybe if you want to enter text into a website, we show, you know, we go back to showing a warning if you're trying to enter text, unless you've included your fingerprints in DNS. Or, you know, maybe it's just for passwords, etc. Yeah, this, this gets us a whole lot, all right? So if we improve our fraud detection, if we can get rid of relying on the certificate authorities and we can start looking at this as, you know, statistical analysis of the person who's doing the, who's doing the browsing, the sites that they're going to, and the information that's being passed, we can get as good as email, which is really damn good. Um, Certificate authorities can switch to a system where cost scales with risk, where they start offering real value, and when they start fueling real innovation um, and pushing for real changes, right? The Sony hack was absolutely awful, and anybody going in there would have seen a Sony password folder where they had passwords for everyone and said, what the hell is this? Um, we're not going to give you any of this insurance that you so desperately need. Um, and, you know, really everyone hates the hackers that broke into Sony, but Sony, for having such poor operational security, and they really should come under a whole lot of blame. They have a whole lot of blame to take for this. Um, in terms of encryption as a separate orthogonal issue, uh, we're backporting universal encryption to 1.0. I understand we haven't necessarily solved the, the identity issue yet, but this sort of thing would shut down the NSA's opportunistic surveillance. It would shut down really big swaths of easy to do surveillance. It makes censorship much, much harder, like the Great Triangle the Great Firewall of China, uh, because instead of just looking at packets as they flow across the network and doing analysis that way, they actually have to have bots that go to these sites. And they can't just have bots, they have to have bots that look like real bots. Um, and, you know, WikiLeaks and others have, have shown that their censorship efforts are greatly delayed whenever they require HTTPS on there. Um, We've also seen China making a lot of attacks on iCloud, Gmail, others, impersonating, doing a just doing a straight man in the middle on these accounts. Um, that's really not good. Uh, it is a nation state at war. You know, uh, you know. Basically, we've seen China and the U.S. at war with individual users, and this would make that war more costly for their side. Um, this also opens room for innovation from Namecoin and possibly BitShares because we have these trustless blockchain technologies um, that solve the identity issue. And this would give us an API, this would give us a way in that we can provide DNS information with the security information paired with it that is also resistant to government control, right? Um, 
the you know the whole idea of these blockchain technologies is that you are in control of the encryption. You put it into the blockchain. We all accept that that was your private key that put it there, and we're not relying on the TLD to sign the individual DNS records as they go through. Um, you know, as silly as it sounds, I consider myself a Mozilla. I grew up during the browser wars. I saw the importance of the open web. Um, and that's what's really at stake here. The web's ability to operate as a platform independent platform. Uh, the ability to, to connect to the largest distributed computing project in the world. Uh, you know, the web, the URL bar has created a function call interface that is somehow usable for normal people. That is the magic of the web. That is something that no one else has been able to replicate. Um, and we have essentially abdicated the security of that system. And that's really, really scary. Because now app stores and others can offer superior security, which they, is a real, real problem for the continuation of the open web, for the success of the open web. So to review, web crypto is broken and the attack is basically deterministic. Um, Self-censored in name, mean universal SSL. You know, we have this uh, Let's Encrypt nonprofit that's going to boot it up. They wouldn't give me their exact fees, but I know it's on the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars to run this nonprofit certificate authority. That's a step in the right direction. We could also just not do that. We could also just do native encryption through DNS. Um, and finally, let's support research, but let's let's not block improvements. One of the problems I had trying to get funding with this is I'd get replies back saying, yeah, it needs more research. And it's like, well, yes, but we need to start working on it now. And we have real solutions we can implement now. And let's not let the progress block those improvements. Questions? All right, thank you.